Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by legendary trainer and the newest member of the International Boxing Hall of Fame, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how are you? I'm good. I thought that maybe it wouldn't be too, I don't know, one of those words that I don't like, presumptuous or silly to wear this shirt now. I've had it probably about five years. I never wore it. Mm -hmm. um, I bought it one time when I was doing a fight plan. I had never went to the Hall of Fame uh, during the induction weekend, but I've been up there to do fight plans when we were doing Friday Night Fights. And yeah, you guys remind me, my microphone, sometimes you don't <laughs> hear me. And think, give Ken a big, give him a big uh, hug out there in the way that you give hugs, because he's the one who's making sure that my volume was up the way you guys want it to be up. So, during the 18 years of Friday Night Fights, I've done a bunch of fight plans up there and some interviews. So that was the only time I was up there, but never during the actual weekend when it's happening. And so I, I had this shirt, but I would never wear it. I felt, I don't know, it just feels like you're, you're being silly, like you're trying to show somebody that you're something, that you should just be whatever you are. But I'm not going to wear it probably ever again. <laughs> because of those feelings, but I figured on this show, since you guys like shirts, um, it would be appropriate and it would be okay. You would allow me uh, to wear it at least one time. Uh, and again, it's not that you're trying to raise a flag or anything, but I figured, it was a, as I said, if it was appropriate, it would be fun to wear it. And I could finally get it out of the closet and my wife told me to throw it away because it, I, I never wear the damn thing. So I figured, all right, get it on but it was you guys were up there you and rob came up there and i appreciate it appreciate you being there appreciate all my family of course it was better than i thought it was going to be it was um i never thought i would talk in these in these terms but if there was a heaven for boxing people that's it no for sure <laughs> it, it was it really was well done and you got 300 volunteers who the whole town embraces it. I mean, it's a town affair. It's a love affair. The town, 5,000 people in Canastota, and they all come out. They all come out for the parade, and they're all involved, and then people migrate from all over, the boxing people from everywhere, from all over the country to get there. I mean, from London. I had people coming in. They said, we flew in from London. I said, you really did? You really flew in? I said, yeah, Teddy, we we flew in for this. It's an unbelievable weekend if you're a boxing fan. I mean, to get up close and personal with guys like yourself, Marvin Hagler, Michael Moore, or Mickey Ward, highlight of the weekend, <laughs> chatting was, with yeah. Mickey. Well, we have a, we did an interview with Mickey, and um, you guys, oh. you're, you're hearing. I mean, when we get it up, but it was Mickey's special. I mean, Mickey's special, what he's done in the ring, he's special outside the ring, he's a salt of the earth. I think that's a proper phrase for him, salt of the earth type person. There's not a million salt of the earth type people when you use those kind of terminologies. And um, he he gave us an interview. We did a, uh, he said something, he made, he said something on our interview that he had never talked about before. And you guys, when you see it, you you understand. But um, he, he made a, he made a statement about something that took place in his life. And um, I didn't know he was going to go there. I, I asked him some questions to try to understand, for you guys to understand how you become that, that special, that hard. And that hard. You know, he's such a special person outside the ring, such a beautiful person. But then he becomes that hard person, that, that extraordinarily hard person that you have to be to have gone through the, the wars and the fires that he's gone through in his life in the ring. And how do you become that? I mean, I mean, part of it is the development in, in the gym. I understand that. I mean, if you would understand it better, I mean, it's what I do. But I also understand, having understood that, that it's got to be from more than just there. It's got to be from outside. It's got to be from life. And so we talked about that, and he gave us an answer that part of me was, I'll be honest, part of me was... Um, Ashamed of myself that I went there. I didn't know. I mean, I was oh, like, but but Mickey had no problem with it because Mickey's honest. Mickey's Mickey. Mickey, you know, Mickey lives his life as it should be lived. That's an open book of, of truth. 
and as we should all live it. And so he's got nothing to, to but he said, I, I don't think I've talked about this before, yeah. you know? And that moment became the moment he talked about it. Yeah. Not too many people would be that forthright and that honest uh, about it. But then again, not too many people like Mickey Ward. They yeah. could face the things. If you could face the things he faced, you could face whatever it is in your life that uh, somebody might not know about and um, might not understand. But he, when he came out with it, when he said what he said, I, I did. I felt like, why did I go there? But I, I was just going to not know it was taking us there, just that it was going to take us to somewhere that would just explain how you become... As as I said, how you could become as extraordinarily rough, <laughs> mentally tough, <laughs> durable, um, impenetrable. Uh, how do you become that? Um, so, and he told us, and he it was like, like I said, I, I felt, I felt a little mad at myself that not knowing it was going to take us to that place. But um, then again. There's, like Mickey would say, there's nothing to be mad about. It's if he didn't want to say it, he wouldn't say it. That's and, right. And he's obviously that kind of man. But it was, it's an interview that you people will. I, I hope you're gonna like it. And um, but getting back to the Hall of Fame, it was just a special. It was better than I thought it would be. It was a special time. Uh, as I said, my speech. The most important thing for me was sharing it with family and friends. Yeah. And. Being able to, this sport takes, you know, I've always tried to use my platform and ESPN and other places for more than just, you know, we, we get paychecks for what we do. And um, I wanted to use the platform for a little more than that if I could, because I felt I could. Mm -hmm. To I'm no hero, but... I thought that I could help the fighters, I could help the sport uh, by having that platform in spots, in places. So if I could, I and I had those spots and those places, I was not hesitant to use it for that. I felt that it was almost, you don't want to make yourself that important, but it was like a responsibility a little bit that if I could be in that position, and boxing doesn't have a national czar, doesn't have a national commission, it doesn't have the protective mechanisms in place like the other sports have, right? To protect it. I figured, hey, I'm not like I'm I'm not looking for the job, but uh it doesn't exist. And again, if I could if I could help out a little bit, if I could put a light in places that could better uh the sport a little bit or advance the sport in some ways or help the fighters in some ways i felt like i should do it that's the and, part of that that's the part that i really enjoyed is that you were getting recognized for being the voice of boxing and for well, your I honesty don't know about that but i i just i the point i'm making is that when i when you choose to do that and you spend your life over 40 years in one thing, like I have in boxing. Like I said in my speech, you know, somebody once said to make an omelet, you gotta break up, you gotta break some eggs. Mm -hmm. And to have a career, you gotta miss stuff. And when you miss it, you might be able to deal with it, but it, it also impacts your family. And nobody knows how it affects you because I'm not going to show them. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like being a fighter. You know, you watch a fighter, watch a human being in anything. And you people out there, you know, you you might be going to your first board meeting. Oh, my God. You know, I, I'm so scared. I'm so nervous. I got to go to the bathroom again. Uh, it doesn't show. It doesn't show. You think it shows. But it doesn't show because you're putting forward the front you need to put forward. You don't realize that. Because just because you feel it inside don't mean that it shows. <laughs> nobody sees it unless you do something to show it. Probably something weak and give in to it. But we all feel it. And so, you know, I... When when you're 
involved in a career and like I said you you put forward all that that time and you're not showing you know when I had to miss certain things for the family I'm not gonna you're not gonna see it in me but it it hurts and you know for me what the hall represented was with all those dates that I missed like you know you miss a dance recital for your daughter you miss birthday parties you miss uh, holidays graduations Christmases like I said Thanksgivings and you miss those things you don't get them back now we know why you do it. You're, you're not a, you know, you don't get an award for it. You're, you're being a father, you're being a provider, you're being a husband, and whatever you do. But it deteriorates you, and then you go because you feel like you missed out on something. You feel like you didn't give something to the most important people in your life. Without them, there is no reason to do what you do. Your family, and so. It erodes you to a certain degree. You don't show it. You don't show it. But you you feel it. And then you go into camps and you go around the world and you train these fighters. Like, I'm not, I, I say it. I trained, uh, one of them was Donnie Lalonde. He wound up getting a $6 million fight with Leonard. We won't go into it heavy, but uh, I wasn't there for the $6 million. But what was I there for? I was there to get to that point, to develop them to build them and some of those places was not Caesars Palace Las Vegas it was Enid Oklahoma for one hundred dollars that's was that was my take one hundred dollars and it was a little bit after Thanksgiving so I had to train them so on Thanksgiving morning instead of being in a parade you know with my beautiful beautiful son who had rosy cheeks and he was three years old and he looked like a little pumpkin. And, you know, he was waiting for dad to take him to the parade. I couldn't go. I was in Gleason's gym instead uh, with the keys because the owner gave me the keys early in the morning, training him before we went to in Oklahoma because that's what I needed to do. And um, you... And then you, you don't have... The other things that you think you're doing it for, the payoff, because you get let down. And like everybody does in life, you get let down, you know. Sometimes it's stronger, you get betrayed. But you get let down. You know, it happens. It's, hey, it's part of life. And um, so you don't get the payoff for your kids, the reason why you missed that Thanksgiving parade. And, you know, so there's a lot of those things. And a lot of pieces. You know, we understand. I always f try to fight for the fighters because a piece of them could be lost in the ring. I always say it. Why do I fight for the fighters? Because when they go in the ring, they don't come out whole sometimes. And But as a trainer, you're not taking the punches. But there's emotional blows. They take something out of you. And um, you do get physical blows. I've had every two cracked. <laughs> Because when you're teaching them, punch is mess. I always wondered if they were by accident. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, mean, I, I gotta you, believe. They, I gotta <laughs> believe Michael Moore might have let a few I, well, slip they, off the I, pad. I think there was a couple that he might have, uh, <laughs> you know, by let his judgment, but let his 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 aim go off a little. He he deserves it. He deserved it. He deserved to get one back at me. Well, super but, nice of him to uh, join yeah, up. Yeah, he the flew hall. in. Yeah. But the point I'm making is that. You go, and just like the fighters lose a piece, you go th through a career like that, and you you do lose pieces of yourself all over the place in different gyms and um, in different boxing arenas all over the country, even in places like Enid, Oklahoma, which I never heard of till I got there. <laughs> and you uh, you don't get them back. You, you you get depleted. You do. 
You, you, you become less of yourself a little bit. And you do it for the better, again, you're not, not no martyr, no, no. But we're talking life, we're talking truth. Um, you, you get deteriorated a little bit, you do. And you try to remind yourself, you try to be better. I try every day to be better, to not take it out on someone, to not be short, not to be any less respectful with this guy than you would with the guy who's, you know, maybe the CEO of ESPN. Uh, but you, you do lose, you lose something. You lose a little bit of yourself. And the Hall of Fame, for me, was a chance to get some of that back, to get some of those pieces back for your family. To get that Thanksgiving day back to your son. You know, and I didn't think it would be that, but it was. To get it back and to say to your son, as I said to each one of my members, my family, my wife, thank you. Mm -hmm. Princess, my daughter, Nicole, thank you. Bud, it's my son, I call him Bud, thank you. So... It was. It couldn't be better than that. It doesn't get better than that. And that's what it was. And it was special. And I never thought it would be, to be honest, because what's a Hall of Fame, really? It's it's a. It's too much about people patting themselves on the back sometimes, and uh, that's not pretty. But this wasn't not that. It wasn't that. It was. It was the chance to again, to just get whole again a little bit to, to for your family, to, to give them something that you took away from them. And um, so in that way, it was really special when you guys were there. And I had so many friends that flew in from all over the country, Vegas and L.A. and Lake Tahoe, my production crew. Uh, most of them were, all came in, the ones that count to me, the ones that have been with me for all those years at ESPN, they all flew in. Uh, my producers, the ones that were there from the beginning, uh, like Matt Sanduli, all those guys, they they all came in, and it was it was extraordinary. I mean, I made a joke. A couple of my guys came in. They drove twelve hours from Kentucky, and they brought real Kentucky moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, but um, but it was uh, it was really special. And the fans, all the fans that were there and you guys, and you guys even ran in a couple of races. They had a 5K race and a, what was the other one? 5K and 12K. And 12K. Three miles and seven and a half. Yeah, and, but you know, a lot of people, a lot of entries. Do you remember how many entries were in them? I know it was a pretty good amount. I'm not sure. The because total, I started was, the race. Yeah. I, they asked me to start the race. And <laughs> do you I, remember the false well, start? I, I messed that up. <laughs> no, the, I, I messed it up. The I police up. How cruiser, do you mess up? The police the cruiser was in front of the car, right in front of the race, and uh, the director's telling Teddy, "All right, just tell him on your mark, get set." So as Teddy yells "Go," and I look up, the cop is standing in the road outside of his car, waving frantically. It reminded me of a scene from the movie Animal House when the uh, parade goes crazy and the cop is like, "Everyone, remain calm." And uh, eventually. <laughs> Eventually, everyone stopped and we started over again. But that was uh, quite a moment well, I always of levity. Try to do things differently, and uh, that was different. <laughs> I, I started a race once when you could start it twice, so <laughs> it was know, definitely entertaining. But you guys ran in both races. Uh, you ran in the twelve k, and Rob ran in the five k, yeah. and uh, you both won. And there was, like I said, there was a lot of entries. And from what I understand, not only did you win, there was <laughs> nobody was near you guys I, <laughs> because I was there at the finish line. And it was, you guys came in and we had to wait a while for everyone else. You guys were really something, you you ran great races and um, you were 15 seconds, if I remember someone was telling me, off of the, the, the record for it, the fastest ever. And I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I don't think you were pushing it because there was kind of like nobody really near you. Yeah. And you easily could have, I think you could have easily broke that record if you you would have known. You should have known. You should have <laughs> well, known. You push. I you was, push even if someone's not near. Even I if know. someone's not learn a lesson. No, I learned. Someone's not there. Me. You push. I learned. <laughs> and um, so you you didn't break it. You're 15 seconds off it. Um, so uh, now we have to we have to maybe go to another Hall of Fame just so you can break that record. But <laughs> you uh, you guys were great, and everybody was up there and. 
Sam Rivera came up there and did some. Yeah, some, Sam Rivera some, films. Uh, yeah, he got a lot of good footage of you that hopefully we'll be able to share some of those clips in uh, coming special episodes. And I just want to share a few things um, from the Hall of Fame that I know you're not going to talk about and some of them you may not even know. But uh, one of the things that I was talking to your wife about, Elaine, who's just the nicest person Thanks. in the world, literally the first person on Sunday morning to send me a text saying happy Father's Day. Um, she's just the best. She's so supportive. And uh, she shared some stories with me as we were on Saturday um, when we arrived. They had a, you know, there were a bunch of different events. And one of the events was um, an autograph signing um session basically outside of the hall and there was a line literally around the block and i know they had you on a, a very tight schedule ed brophy wants to make sure he gets as many people into as many events as he could and they were saying teddy come on we got to get to the chicken barbecue or whatever's next and i see the line and i look at you and i looked at ed and i said ed i promise you he's not going to leave until this line is done and sure enough we stayed there for probably two hours longer than should. Blew off the chicken barbecue, unfortunately, for those people that were waiting there. But not only did you sign all the autographs, but there was a little kid there shadow box, and you got down and started giving him some mitt work. You took pictures with every person and listened to every single story about every fight that they ever attended. It was, it was just a some really honest. Uh, emotional moments of you just connecting with the fans. But one of the stories that your wife shared with me was um, in the past when you were training fighters that one time she took the kids, you literally had a connecting flight in New York and she took the kids to the airport just so they could spend a few minutes with you between while you were rushing from one flight to the next. And she said it was so emotionally draining on everyone in the family. that She was like, that's the last time we ever did that. It was just too hard. And she also talked about when your son was very young and he would call you from camps and say, dad, what are you watching on TV? And then he'd put the same thing on. What color is the room? And he'd pretend that he was in the same room just to connect with you. And anyone out there who has children can, will, will be able to identify with this because I've done similar things with my own kids. And those are the kind of moments where I, I don't know about you, but when I hang up, I'm like an emotional mess because I'm like, you just don't want to miss anything. But like you said earlier, when you're the provider, it's like a fine balance. And my children, I was here yesterday for Father's Day and they're like, Dad, we want you to be here. And sometimes I have to remind them of like, you you like those Air Jordan shoes and all the nice things. Like, I can't just go and pick those out of a, pick those off the shoe tree. So I have to go. Well, I'm glad them. you have a real job because you show us how I make it. Here. <laughs> hey, I'd pay you to do this. This is uh, this is my dream job. Um, Although we, we're getting there. We're, we're getting to a, to a place where actually uh, people are coming to us because of you guys. Actually, sponsors. that's a good segue. We have our first sponsor today, and uh, we couldn't be more proud to have them involved. And uh, just to give some background for the fans, we're only working with sponsors and um, partnering with brands that we've identified as partners that we want we've reached out to them and the first one that we have here today is um 10,000 they're a sports apparel company and they really specialize in workout shorts and you know they have copy they'd like me to read but I want to just tell you like personally <laughs> organically what I really think about them and, and that's you know, what that's consistent with what the show is yeah and, we, and we say what we feel exactly and and as you mentioned, you know, we, Rob and I run a lot. Our producer, Rob Moore and Teddy, obviously in the gym with um, current trainer, a current fighter, Alex Vosdick frequently. And, um, you know, finding a pair of shorts that works, especially when it's hot out like it's been, is important, especially when you're running like this morning, I ran 15 miles. It's important that you have stuff that works good because if you're not running in shorts that are comfortable for 15 miles in this humidity, it's not going to be a pretty sight when you go to take a shower. Um, and those people who run know exactly what I'm talking about. But these if guys. If I ran 15 miles, we'd be doing a promo for stretches <laughs> on wheels. Well, everything is relative in life. If I could box really well, I wouldn't have to uh, run so much to prove that I'm still relevant. I'd have all my title belts hanging in my trophy room instead of trying to win it's the 4th like of July do. turkey trot. <laughs> the 4th of July raise the turkey trot on Thanksgiving. But anyway, these guys at 10,000, go to 10,000.cc slash the fight for exclusive um, discount code for our listeners. Um, if you like the show, obviously this stuff isn't free for us to produce. This helps us offset some of the costs. And if you want to support the show, please support the sponsor. I'll get right to it. If you want us to stay and keep doing this, please. 
uh, it, it's one way that we'll be able to continue doing this. And um, there'll be other sponsors too. This is, I think, one of our first. First of a few right? that we're working on, yep. But, so uh, and, if you can and help I, these guys. Well, I mean, listen, you shouldn't just do it. There's got to be incentives for anything in life, right? So for me, one would be you like to see our mugs and hear our voices. Um, you'd like something about what we do, then again, it takes something to be able to continue doing this, and sponsors is one of those somethings. All right, that's number one. Number two, I wouldn't do it, and neither would Ken, but I can only speak for myself. I wouldn't do it until I tried to stuff on, and I don't need extra shorts, so I, it's <laughs> not like I needed the product. But um, I said if if I'm going to do it, you got to give me some product, and I got to wear it, and I got to put it on. And I did. And uh, first of all, it's athletic enough where it, it, you can move with it. it. It fits good. It fits properly. It's not, you know, too baggy or nothing. Um, but for me, at least. And it conforms to your way. You can move and it's athletic. You said you can run, you do what you're supposed to do in shorts. But what I liked about it also was I wear a lot of shorts. I wear a lot of sweatsuits. I'm in the gym. And I'm always casual. And in the gym, of course, that's what you want to wear. And when I go back to training Volzik, Alexander Volzik, I'll be wearing, um, thank you, 10,000. I'm going to have more shorts to wear. But you can also, you can put a polo shirt on and it, it it's like a dress pants too. And that's kind of like a little unique for me at least because I'm always wearing those you know, the Everlast shorts, you know, and <laughs> you're not really putting polo shirts on with them. I mean, you're putting a gym shirt on with them. But with these, you can. You can put on a nice shirt and, uh, hey, presto. You go from the freaking gym, you should take a shower first. <laughs> I, I will say that. But you can make the transition from the gym uh, right to going out to get something to eat uh, as long as they allow shorts uh, with uh, without having to change any apparel. Yeah, and so these guys, like they, they, totally, baby. they do one thing and they do it well. They make shorts. They have three choices. So if you're into CrossFit, uh, lifting weights, um, running, whatever the case may be, they've got you covered. So give them a give them a look. If you if you like them, please let them know. Tell them you heard about us. Uh, you heard about them on the fight. It really helps us a lot, honestly. Um, so with that, Teddy, we uh, I want to get into some of the previous fights, some of the most recent fights, and starting with uh, Triple G and Steve Rolls. Um, very much a mismatch in hindsight. I mean, not too. No, much. no, 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 no. I'm going to correct you. Okay. Not, uh, not in hindsight. We said on the air, if we're wrong, we're going to say it. Yeah. And you guys are going to hear it, so it's not like we could keep a secret anyway. Uh, but. If I'm correct, I said fourth round. I I think I said I said I think uh, somewhere around three four. I might have put in five, but I think uh, we could always go to the videotape. But to, I think to clarify, for, uh, hindsight probably isn't the re isn't the best word. But what I should say is, the fight played out almost exactly as you described it yeah, would. The, and listen, it, it's not the with. Well, I guess I am standing and taking kudos, so I shouldn't say it's not like, but. When we're wrong, we're going to live by that too. I uh, can't be right all the time. But I, it wasn't hard for me because I watched tape of the guy. I'm supposed to know something about this business. Hopefully that's why one of the reasons why you guys listen. But we were pretty much on a button with it. And, but, it, I mean, part of it is it's become the formula for these promoters with these mega deals with the networks to give a layup yep. you know to give the first one an appetizer uh to give a freebie uh they did it with canelo in the first one yep. before they gave him a real fight they uh, did it with wilder they did it with with everybody they did it with fury we'll get to that later um and they did it with triple tree so it's the formula so it's not teddy atlas being smart or anything because it's you don't have to be the mason creskin to figure out they're, they're not going to put them in, you know, with uh, Carmen Basilio, right? <laughs> yeah. we, we understand, or oh, Jake Lamato, or dare I say, the great Sugar Ray Robinson. I won't even go there. But uh, the ones they said are great enough. 
But we, there was, it's not just that we got it right as far as it being four rounds or somewhere in that vicinity, but we got it right about how it would unfold. I remember using the analogy that if a kid's coming up to the big leagues for the first time facing a pitcher like a Bob Gibson, you know, and Golovkin could be Bob Gibson, right? Yeah. A, a, a guy that's known, a guy that's been great. And, well, the first thing Bob Gibson would do to that new kid coming up to the big leagues is welcome to the big leagues <laughs> and give a high and tight 100-mile-an-hour fastball under the year. <laughs> I remember saying that here. Say, yeah. well, what represents a high and tight 100-mile-an-hour fastball under the year in boxing? What could Triple G do? Go put some water in the basement, bang him in the body, and make him know this is different. Make them know this feels different. It's never felt like this for you before. You're in the big leagues. Yep. Introduce him to the big leagues. Let him start thinking the wrong way immediately so you get him out. And that's where I figured it could be four rounds. And he did it. He he went and put water in the basement. He went and put the high tight one under his chin, the, the fastball right down the middle. In this case, the left hooks and the right hands to the body. Yeah. And he introduced him to roles being him, he introduced him to uh, a different level of fighting, to a different feel. Mm -hmm. He let him know right away. This, oh, yeah. this, 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 it feels different, don't it? <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, it does. You know, and um, you know, maybe the next sponsor, if I could do more of this, would be Campbell's Soup, because <laughs> that's uh, you listening, Campbell's out there, so we can keep doing these things, uh, because that. That that comes next when you bang a guy in the body that ferociously. Campbell's soup for about a week. Yeah. Uh, because that's what you're drinking. That's what you're eating. Uh, because you're not taking in solids. So that's that's how the fight panned out. And I'll tell you, I you want my evaluation on him? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I my evaluation on him, my report card, and you know I'm 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 critical when I have to be critical. But I try to be complimentary the same way if it calls for it. I think Jonathan Banks did a good job. I think that he looked better to me. Now, I know some people are going to say he got hit. Teddy got hit with this punch. He pulled, yeah, he pulled back. He got hit a punch that probably looked more than it was because the way he got caught, um, it was pretty visual. He got caught pulling back. He got caught stopping his head in the middle once. But I think it was because he was trying new things. I saw new things. I saw improved fighter from when he was with the other guy. Uh, Abel Sanchez. Yeah. I, I, saw, I saw an improved fighter. What did I see? What did you see, Ted? Well, first of all, I saw someone revitalized. I thought that he wasn't worn out physically. I thought he was fresher physically. I think that Sanchez had overtrained him in some fights. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that. But, I, I saw a guy that was fresher physically. He looked like he had m more pep to him. Yeah. He looked a little younger. He mm -hmm. looked a little revitalized physically and mentally, uh, where it was fun for him again, where where he had a different energy than I had seen recently, where he was almost starting to look stale. Yeah. Uh, I thought in the last Canelo fight, he looked physically drained. Yes. I, I felt that. I saw, again, I saw where he didn't look that way. He, he looked, he looked fresher and stronger. And part of the proof is the way he went to that body. I saw more combinations. I saw a different array of combinations. I saw a little bit more creativeness uh, instead of the same old stuff. He was more creative, uh, putting punches together. Uh, I saw head movement that I hadn't seen. Yeah, some of it was from too far away. It was from from my aspect, from my point of view. But he was doing it. He was trying, and he had the right idea. And that idea was given to him by somebody that he hadn't gotten before that yeah. because he hadn't really shown that uh, to that degree, to that level. So I saw all those things, and those are good things. And I give Jonathan Banks credit for that because he's the man that was there in, in this transition. And I also saw to the point of creativeness and to the point of being just mentally more up and more yeah. more like like it was fun again was I saw I loved the way he finished the fight and I guarantee you there's very few people out there I know the commentators didn't mention it that picked up on how he finished his fight and if you guys watch it 
Watch it with this in mind. He turned southpaw. Nobody yeah. mentioned it. He turned southpaw and he delivered. And there's my man. My man never lets me down, Rob, a uh, producer here. And he turns southpaw. Now, see, he's in the orthodox position, left foot forward. You know, now looks, he turns southpaw. And he goes back to orthodox again. Now, again, left hand forward, left foot forward. He's a orthodox fighter right now. He's got him up against the ropes. He's, lo he's looking for the finishing punch. Southpaw. He turns southpaw. Freeze that. Go back and some people will see this and appreciate it the way it should be appreciated. It wasn't an accident. Watch. Now, keep it there. Look. I will right, we'll get back to it. But he, he's he got him in trouble. He's looking for a stop. He's looking for a finishing punch, right? So he turns southpaw. Now, let me tell you, this is his own little genius and why, you know, obviously he's a world champion. And I know I've knocked Triple G say he's overrated, uh, but I didn't say he wasn't really good. And, you know, he's been king for a while. And I think sometimes he got away with it with Sanchez with his physicality. But... Part of it, before we go too far here, he's he's not in with the highest level of opponent. That's so what I was just going to say. Yeah, no, say and you're right. And you're very right. Very overmatched. But here, he showed some of that creativeness and some of why he is king. He turns southpaw because he knows that he's changing the angles of his punches. That's going to change the eyesight and the eye coordination of, of roles. What do I mean by that? All of a sudden, the punches are coming from one angle. Now they're coming from a different angle. So the eyes don't match up quick enough. They don't make the adjustments quick enough to the punches coming from a different angle. And just a little subtle thing like that can create a knockout. This was created. The point I'm making is, you know, I know he did it with this level, but he did it because of his brain, his intellect, his experience. He's calm enough under uncalm circumstances to, to do this, to turn southpaw where suddenly the left hand became the power hand. Mm -hmm. Not the jabbing hand, not the setup hand anymore. Now it became the power hand, just like the right hand is normally the power hand because it's the back it's the back hand where you could turn into, where you could turn and put your back into it, like there. Now, just keep it there. So watch, watch this now. So he turns southpaw, so now it's going to come from a different angle, and the left hand becomes the power hand, not the setup hand anymore. It's the power hand now where he could turn his foot into it. He could turn his back into it. It's coming from a further place back instead of from here where that normally would be the jabbing hand from the lead. But watch this. Don't do it yet. But when he throws this punch, he places it over here behind the glove, over here. I was going to say, he doesn't just shoot it straight. No, it kind of just purposely. a slight loop around his yeah. around you know why? right hand. It was beautiful. So he could blind him. Yeah. He did it because he knew this glove was going to do some of his work for mm -hmm. him. He knew this gl glove was going to blind Rolls mm -hmm. because the glove's going to get higher. And it's he knew it would take his peripheral away, his vision. And he recognized that under these extreme conditions. And he changed the trajectory, and he made this punch go over here. Normally it would just come down slightly. here. Yeah, yeah, just it would normally come down here, come down the pike, down yep. down Highway 101. But no, he makes it come around here where Rolls' eyes can't pick it up. Now watch, right. so let it roll out, and watch this. This is really, boom! He never saw the punch right. because he threw it from a blind alley. Mm -hmm. And again, you probably didn't hear that that night, but you, if, if you're watching this, and if you're buying these shorts... <laughs> 10,000.cc. 10, All right. If you're, buying, if you're buying these shorts, you continue to be able to get stuff like this and you continue to, you know, get these kind of insights, hopefully. But here we are. And that that is just a magnificent piece of work there under those kind of extreme conditions inside that squared circle where, you know, things are chaotic where there's a fire going on, a fire of emotions, a fire of fear, a fire of danger. Big expectations and, and, and on him. And he's able to think that way and put that punch the way he put it. And there was another one, and Rob will probably pick up on it. There was another spot just before that, and, and I'm sure Rob will grab it, where he, I'm going to name the punch, a corkscrew punch. I, I tell you. I was going to ask I've never, you about I, that. I don't think I've ever seen it before. 
I was going to ask you that he looked to put a little water in the basement. He hit him with some body shots. And then correct me if I'm wrong, because this is how I interpret Rob and I. <laughs> Rob and I watched this fight after the um, Saturday night event at the hall. We watched it back in the hotel room. It looked to me like he softened him up with some body shots and then rolls almost like amateurish, put his head down, which allowed Triple G to hit him with a corkscrew square on top well, of his no, head because he took his eyes off of a good point. Triple G, put the earmuffs on, but not only put the earmuffs on, but took his eyes off his opponent and like an amateur, put his head down because he had no other defense. And Triple G, like a veteran, placed the right shot there, there it is. right now, on top yeah, of his head. Yeah, you're right. See, to take a punch, you have to see it. Exactly. So he's taking his eyes out of play here, he being rolls. Now watch, and slow, stop. See, his head's down, now he can't see it. So what he does is he changed the trajectory again, and he threw that, like, corkscrew punch and clipped him on top of, you know, like... He did like, it to him twice. Yeah. The first yeah, one was worse one when too. he first got him in trouble earlier That's, in the round. Uh, it was no, a big one. Now watch. See? Boom. And he catches him, he don't see, so it hurts him. Very much. And then, of course, he's able to continue... And, you know, and keep the rhythm of the offense going. But, again, creativeness, um, the sign of a champion, th the ability to be calm in an uncalm place, to see things, to think clearly uh, where others would not think clearly in that kind of atmosphere. It's all what makes a great fighter. It's all yeah. what makes a champion. And it was on display. And I just wanted to make sure the people, because some of that stuff is subtle enough where you might not have, seen it yourself yeah you might not have caught it and it's not an accident he it happened because he made it happen yeah because he saw the opportunity like you said he saw the guy's eyes go down he said okay now there's no opening here let me let me create an opening by creating a punch you know what it reminds me of if you see um, a well-seasoned veteran sparring with someone who's new to sparring at that level where triple g was so comfortable and relaxed and he noticed that the guy was taking his eyes off him and putting his head down and it almost looked like a a, 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 a move that a veteran might do in a sparring session just clowning but he saw the opportunity and really that first corkscrew punch is what first got rolls in trouble if you if we can go back far enough you'll there see was another one he starts to get staggered and that's when the beginning of the end now there was another one of those punches that was even more there it is oh, there it is that's it right there perfect spot that was that rob really caught it well with that with that um with that video right there so again kudos to him credit to him you know, you could say, and, and I don't blame you for saying it because I'm the first one to say it, Teddy, but, you know, he was in there with a lesser opponent. Yeah. Yes, but not everybody gets rid of a lesser opponent that way. He got rid of him the way you're supposed to get rid That's of right. a lesser opponent. And um, to that, he gets credit. For sure. And um, speaking of getting opponents out of there quickly, that brings us to the next fight I wanted to talk about, and that's the one that just happened um, this Saturday with um, Tyson Fury um, against Tom Schwartz, and we've previewed that extensively and spoke to um, Schwartz's past fight and some of the character that he's shown in different, in different situations. And, um, you know, there's a lot to discuss in this fight. But first Can I, I say want, one thing? Yeah, of course. I'm going to, again, full disclosure, full disclosure. Uh, we did say on this air that, first of all, we brought out some video on one of George's opponents, which was Exhibit A, and we were not in a court of law, but, you know, we're in this uh, podcast business. It was Exhibit A, if you were in a court of law, of why this was not a legitimate opponent. I think that's fair. That's a tough word. It's a tough word. I'm being, it's tough. But I think it's fair, especially in the aftermath. But uh, but we said it before. Anyone could say something afterwards, say, that guy's stunk, that guy's yeah. terrible. Ah, pew, pew. Yeah, you, I think you should say it first, but not after. It's pretty easy to say it after. But we questioned, we might even save some people a few bucks, maybe. Uh, but we, not that it costs that much to get that that one, but we definitely might have saved some people where they could have went out on a date with their wife instead, uh, instead of staying around to watch that. And 
the reason was we did our due diligence, which we do here, and we we know what we're looking at, I think. And I looked at tape, and I saw one of his opponents where basically Schwartz uh, spit the bit and was looking to get out. You know, he, he was looking to get out. He laid on the floor. He took a dive like Greg Luganis in, in, in the Olympics off the high board. Yeah. I mean, uh, Luganis' is, uh, is form was a little better. But he he took a flop. For sure. And, and he laid on the floor. And fighters don't do that. And I said, I'd rather fight a who behaves like a fighter than one who looks like a fighter. Yep. You know, he had a 24 and all record. He had all that stuff. And, you know, he, he looked okay. He looked okay. But he wasn't okay when the moment came. We saw it. Yeah. Of course, the promoter doesn't want you to know that. Nobody. You, you know, know that that video, you couldn't the, find it anymore on YouTube the days uh, before the fight, honest to God. Really? Two or three days. Really? People, I didn't know that. I promise you. Oh, my Two goodness. or three people came up to Jesus. me at the fight, at the Fury fight, and said, I like that part. The I like the bit that you guys did on the preview of this fight, showing that Gashi incident, because everyone who anyone who would watch that would say he's full of crap. He didn't really get that hurt. Now, okay, the guy headbutted him and he did, but he he went down like he had been shot with a sniper rifle. He needed first aid. They're rubbing his head. His eyes are closed. As soon as the ref says, "I'm not DQing that guy," he's back up and fights another three rounds, and he basically was exposing the fact that he was looking for a DQ. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't aggressive headbutt, but I mean, it didn't cut him. The guy was he dirty. Went, he the, went down like the scene in The Godfather where The Godfather was in the backyard with his grandson in the tomato patches. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he he went down. I mean, you know, I don't know. If, I, I think that movie got an Oscar. I think uh, I, I think that uh, Brando got an Oscar. If, if he had been a stunt double for Brando, he would have gotten at least an Emmy. Yeah. Uh, I I mean I don't know if they give if I'm mixing all, apples and oranges here if they give Emmys to that stuff but he he would have gotten some kind of an award uh, but you don't get it in boxing and uh, you and for me again a tough word but for me that ex we exposed him a little bit for what he wasn't I think that's fair yeah and again we're not doing stuff you know Monday morning quarterback and uh, you know after the Sunday afternoon game. This was, we were doing a Saturday before the game. And that's why on his air, and, and full disclosure, because I'm going to say where I was wrong or where I was off. Yeah. I was, I said at first, you asked me because you, you want to put that element of the show out there for mm -hmm. people that are inclined to bet. And we, um, I said four rounds. I said four, it could go four rounds if, but there's an if. Yep. There's a variable. Fury likes to play around. Mm -hmm. He's like my grandson. He likes to play with his food before he eats it. Yep. Right? So he likes to play around. So if he plays around, it's going nine. Mm -hmm. And But if he don't play around, it could go four. Uh, it wound up going two. So I I did make a statement on ESPN that he would knock him out. And I, I was pretty clear on what I thought Fury was. And I matter of fact, I used the analogy. He's a nice car. And I did it on his air. Yep. He's a nice car. You'll see in a car lot. It's It's got the tires shine on it. The, the, the car has got that beautiful couple coats of wax on it, like you do on your cars. <laughs> I, I've seen your cars. And all, all that, it's beautiful, beautiful. But then you open up the hood, there's no engine. And as a matter of fact, this time I thought there was no carburetor. I yep. mean, there wasn't even a carburetor. And so I said that on ESPN, but then when I was asked to give a number, I said, because I think I had to go one, one way or the other. Yeah. And I was wrong. And because, I mean, I was right, but I was wrong in a way that I said nine rounds because I thought he would play with them enough. What I didn't calculate was how bad Schultz Schwartz was to the point that like to quote one of the greatest boxing people the late great friend of mine but I think it was one of the greatest boxing people ever ever Mickey Duff mm -hmm. he ran England um, back in the day he ran England before Hearn and before before Warren before any of those guys and he he used to say Teddy 
this guy is harder to miss than he is to hit. <laughs> <laughs> that was Schwartz. Oh. It was harder to miss him than to hit him. So once I saw that in the first round, I was watching the governor for ESPN. I said, oh, I should have went with the under. <laughs> I said, because this guy, I, I think that Fury started the first round in the way that I said. That's you know, right. l- like my grandson, he's going to play with his food before he eats it. But, you know, helicopter, and uh, here mm-hmm. comes the airplane. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, I'm with yeah. you. But, I thought the same But thing. then, he, because he was staying outside, he was, he was jamming, he was moving, he was, you know, he's a... He's got the mentality of a little man in a big man's in a heavyweight yep. body. Yeah. He's David and Goliath's body. You know, where and I'm not knocking him. I, I think he's one of the best, if not the best heavyweights out there. Probably the best technical heavyweight right now. No doubt about it. But the point I'm making is to his credit, his when I say the mind of a lightweight, where he's jabbing, he's moving, he's doing the technical things, he's using his legs, he's doing things that you you don't normally see from a heavyweight. Yeah. That's the point I'm making, and uh, at least a heavyweight of this day, this day and age. And he, so he started out that way, and that's why I went with the over because I figured he'd do that for a few hours. But once he saw how easy this was, was like I said, he gets insulted if you miss him. Yeah. So. Once he saw that, he was like in the second round, he came out. And if you needed proof, you, you ever see those cartoons where you used to read those cartoons where they put the cloud up above the guy, what the guy's thinking? The thought bubble? Yeah, the thought bubble. <laughs> yeah. So what he's thinking? Yeah. If there was a thought bubble above, above Fury, you know, he didn't have to say anything. The thought bubble in the second round was when he turned southpaw, when he didn't get touched a punch. And he turned, like in other words, oh, this is easier than I thought. I could be anything tonight. Schwartz I, threw 30 punches, landed but, six. But, but but by coming out, sometimes you say things in your action, yep. in your body language. By coming out southpaw, he didn't have to say nothing. But you know what he was saying? This guy's bad. bad. Yeah, I could do what I want. Oh, my. I could be, I, I could be Gene Tunney. I could be Muhammad Ali. I could be Joe Lewis. I could be I could be Larry Holmes. <laughs> I could be anything I want to be tonight. And you know what? I think I'm going to play around now. I came out. I came out as Uncle Sam. You know, in the first Rocky movie, as Apollo Creed, right? The way he used that. I came out that way. And now I'm going to go to the second Rocky movie, and I'm going to turn Southpaw the way Rocky did. To protect his bad eye, I'm going to turn southpaw, and I'm going to finish this uh, this 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 fun night by finishing southpaw. Uh, I couldn't help but think that it was more of an effort to get that wardrobe on than it was to deal with Schwartz. That the, I, I I like to know how long it took to get that wardrobe on because I guarantee you that's that's where I would have been right with the over oh, yeah. because it probably took longer to get that on than it did to deal with Schwartz, to get rid of Schwartz. And so once he realized how you know easy this was gonna be, he said, shoot, uh, you know, I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna go to him and and you know, get rid of him. And that's what made it, and that's what it is. Hey, see it? Again, more effort went into that wardrobe than, than it took to get rid of Schwartz. When I saw them come out, I was at the fight. I sent out a tweet that said, uh, Schw- uh, So I just want to finish one sorry, thing. Go ahead. No, so I'm saying to you, I'm, I was wrong. I mean, I was right in my idea of the, you know, what Schwartz was and wasn't, but I was wrong in saying that Fury's personality would allow him to stretch the fight out because it didn't. And it, I wound up saying nine and I was wrong. But I feel bad because I cost you money. Oh, that's all right. No, no, I do. Because <laughs> after what I had said, the first part, you jumped on the under. You said, And after what you saw, yeah. you, you saw an empty can. Well, to you be saw, honest, I, I, I and, underestimated how And then I talked, you, I talked you into going over after you bet the under or you were going to bet the under. And... and you know what? I feel bad for that. Oh, so I'm going okay. to give you a pair of shorts because <laughs> these are really, really good shorts. And um, these are mine. You're the best. But they're yours. A uh, couple observations that I want to mention about um, that fight. And um, I hate being critical of fighters because I have the utmost respect for anyone that wants to get in the ring and fight another guy for money to entertain other people. But my God, Schwartz, I just 
watching that Gashi fight and then seeing the way he behaved the minute, the minute he got touched to the nose and saw that blood, you could literally see him looking for a point where in which he could quit. And as soon as they started, he started putting it on him. Like you said, Fury, the minute he saw him connect one shot, Fury started clowning him, putting his hands down, moving around. The second round, just totally disrespecting his his abilities. And I got to be honest, that was a... That was a terrible, terrible matchup. That guy had no business being in there with Fury. That was but the we biggest. Said it. Yeah, hundred percent. I just didn't think like you. I thought that Fury would stretch it out and wouldn't expose himself. But I think even Fury was surprised at how overmatched he was. was. He should not have been in there. How they made that fight. Uh, Oh, it's With the exception of Schwartz's performance, it was a fun night. There was um, enter- a couple of really entertaining fights on the undercard, but I just want to mention the crowd at um, this fight versus the um, Wilder fight and the AJ fight, like three completely different crowds, in my opinion. I found the Wilder crowd to be the most, um, the Deontay Wilder crowd at the Barclays Center. I thought that that was the most... Um, kind of electric crowd the people were and, and not to take anything away from the aj crowd at msg it was also very loud it was just a very different feel the barclays felt more like a brooklyn crowd a lot of hardcore boxing fans the aj crowd had a lot of brits there very very you know boisterous and into it this vegas crowd was literally you know if, if 10 percent of the people there knew anything about boxing that might have been a stretch well, it was a less of a crowd too much less I mean, and it, it was, was a lot of empty seats much less and hey, but i'm gonna jump in and then yeah, we'll yeah. let you finish there's one thing i gotta say that's where i use this quote and sometimes i'm wrong where the great promoter the great bottom and bailey used to say this is sucker born every minute maybe it's every 10 minutes mm-hmm. maybe it's every half hour sometimes but it's not every minute sometimes because they were, because of the empty seats that were there. Not everybody was a sucker. No. Nope. A lot of <laughs> it, 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 you, you promoters out there that think you're always pulling a wall over you guys' eyes. You guys' eyes. I do it the right way in front of the mic. Mm-hmm. No. You guys are smart. You guys are smart. And they, they, they saw this one. Yeah. Maybe we helped a few. Mm-hmm. Maybe. But they saw it. They saw this one coming. They smelled it. Yeah. You know, when it, when it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it might be a duck. They 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 saw it. And again, indicative of the empty seats. Yeah. yeah. The Vegas crowd was much more of like a high heels tuxedo. Look at me. Let me look at you. Let everyone looking around to see who's who. The promoter flew in every fighter in his stable, you know, just to create some buzz. Shaq was or, there. Or ESPN might have. Uh, yeah. Because, I mean, it's it's... Listen, they they gave a hundred million dollars, and and look, they're not doing anything. I, I say it again, I'm not picking on th- this promoter because we said it across the board. Yeah, you know, uh, the zone did the same thing with Canelo with the first one. They did the same thing with uh, with Triple G. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Yeah, you know, they they gave an appetite. They gave a layup. Uh, they gave a freebie. Uh, they gave a gift. Yep, and and. We just hope that the next one is the legitimate one because that's been the pattern so far. Mm-hmm. You know, Canelo, the next one, he fought Teddy Jacobs, a legitimate fight. And now I think that it's not even the promoter or the network trying to be good guys. They, they, they're they not dumb. They, they, they're they business people. They have to give a better one now if the people are going to, if they're going to yeah. make their money on the money they laid out to get this marquee name, they're going to have to give the, viewer give the consumer something now to get them to come yeah uh, and and so they give a free one just to wet the whistle just to let him get his feet you know under him and now they're gonna go and you're gonna have to the problem with it is for for this case in heavyweights is who they're gonna fight because again the way the boxing business works now you can't make the best fights to, to, to a certain extent, unless they happen to be with the same stable, with the same promoter. But if they're not, you can't make it. That's right. It's very hard to That's make. That's right. Because, you know, one promoter has fighter, the promoter A has these fighters. Uh, hey, I like that guy. I don't like him with anyone over there, but I like him. I like him a lot. Who do you like him with? Well, I like him with someone with promoter B. Well, it ain't happening. 
because no. they're not going to get together because you know they they're going to keep them separate because uh, they're working with their network and they're going to they're, they're going to keep their guys on one side of the street and the other guys are going to be on the other side unless it's extraordinary circumstances which you know her and Aram and them, they get together they they do things but it would have to really really be extraordinary to to get together and do it uh likelihood it's it, it's, it's harder because of what i just described yeah but um so that's the inherent problem is who will fury fight now Aram's got a guy with signed up. He 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 used to have a guy named. Let me see if I can remember the name, Andy Ruiz. <laughs> and but he but the guy got released, and he's not with him no more. And that wouldn't have been a bad one, you know. Uh, Fury with Ruiz for the title that would have been all right. But he's he's not there no more. Uh, Aram gave him his release. I well, think you know who uh, I back saw? in January. But he does have a guy, I believe, named Pulev. And now, do I want to see that fight? No, I got to be honest with you. I think Pulev uh, has been, he's got one loss. I think uh, it was to Klitschko. He, he was a guy that was, I don't know if he was an Olympian, but he was a guy with a, a huge background of amateur fights, an amateur star. Uh, he was undefeated. Then he, yeah, you guys look it up. Then he, then he lost to Klitschko. But he, um, I don't think a lot of them, but but he is one of those a guy that uh, Top Rank does have with ESPN, and he could become a candidate, obviously to fight Fury because he's under that banner, uh, I believe. Well, uh, I think he might have a new another heavyweight coming in under his banner because, uh, <laughs> much to my uh, shock, I see sauntering into the uh, fight in time for the main event at the Fury fight is uh, Jarrell Miller. Now you would think given the circumstances, that that would be the last place that he would want to hang out a couple of months after um, his suspension for three different banned substances. But nope, he came strolling in, and I saw a post-fight interview with Jarrell Miller in the press center saying that he's interviewing promoters to see who he wants to go Interview with. Yeah, now you would think that the guy who suspended for doping, who sabotaged the heavyweight <laughs> title shot that went to Andy Ruiz and subsequently so did all the belts, that he would be persona non grata. But he's these right. Events. There's a market. There's a market for for, for heavyweights to fight these guys. Uh, there's a market, and uh, you have to have guys that you can sell, guys that you know you can put forward to put in there. And and there's not only a market for it. Um, it's it's um, it's quite profitable. It's quite I mean, profitable. Am I am I crazy to think that that was a bizarre scene to see? A guy on a doping suspension come in as clearly an invited guest. He was sitting in the. Well, in another sport, in the, you know, in another business, you wouldn't see it probably because there would have been a tougher repercussions. You know, more shame attached to it, and and just more real penalty attached to it. More real circumstances. You know, difficult circumstances. Obviously, seems to be zero. Uh, more penalty. punishment. He lost there, one fight, there, but he's going to get another one. But but the, you don't even lose a fight. See, the reality. It's like David Copperfield. It's like smoke and mirrors. It's like a mirage. It's 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 like trickery. Hey, oh, they give a suspension. Oh, oh hey, fighters. What do they fight? Every, time what do they anyway. fight every six months? In heavyweight, so, sometimes so, once a year. So. <laughs> So what's he losing? What's being taken away? So that's to your point. Of course he's going to show up because it's kind of like a kid that does something wrong, you know, and the parent the parent says to him, you're not going to, you can't eat spinach for a week. Really? <laughs> oh, really? I'm not surprised. Well, really? I'm not surprised that Miller showing up. I, but, I'm surprised that he would be an invited guest no, no, with but, a credential. But you're not going to be able to eat spinach or or, or carrots. Or, or broccoli, or string beans. No castor oil for no, you. No, none of those things. And and uh, you know what? Until you become better. And now the kid, he's going to be out there smiling in the playground. He's going to be running around. How could you be smiling? You just did something wrong, and you got punished. No, you didn't. The kid's not stupid. He didn't feel the punishment. So he didn't feel anything's wrong. So if you don't feel the punishment, how do you feel there's something wrong? So you show up at a fight. Because there is nothing wrong, apparently. So to your point, and that's how you get it. Somewhere else, you know, somewhere else in another sport, I mean, in baseball or something like that, you might be talking about, uh, you might be talking about a 200-game suspension. You might be talking about a 300-game suspension. Yeah, 300-game suspension, yeah. 
Yeah. Funny you mentioned that because A Rod was sitting right there next to him on the um, ringside. Speaking of doping. Yeah, yeah, he was there. He was there, and um, I, I had, to, I watched it because I, I covered it. I, I was doing the post fight stuff, you know, and the pre fight stuff too, um, for that. But, you know, the thing at the end of the day. Getting back to this Pulev, who might become one of the ball. He, he got was knocked a, out by Klitschko in the got, fifth round. Yeah. Now, see, I just don't think much of Pulev. I mean, he was a guy that they, he was a good amateur, and they, they built him up, and you know, he was supposed to be the next good thing, uh, you know, and he was he was going to be something. I just think he turned out. Not everyone turns out to be what you think they're going to be. Not not it doesn't always happen. And now at his age and at this point. Uh, how old is he? He's you uh, got his age. He there. is um, thirty-eight years yeah. old, and his wins. Hold on, uh, he's his older wins, than I thought. His wins are against Huey Fury, Huey Fury, yeah. uh, Tyson's brother, yeah. Samuel Peter, who was probably sixty when he fought him. Derek Chisora. I mean, Chisora is a, uh, yeah, a good. Yeah, Chisora is okay. Guy. He won a split decision. Yeah. Twelve. I just don't split think he decision. developed into what. Now look, he's a legitimate guy as far as size and as far as. Uh, being, being a legitimate amateur background that he had, you know, with that pedigree, all that. So that's just a possibility. I'm not saying it's going to be him. I, I think he's in that stable, um, but I'm not really interested in that one. But they're gonna they're gonna have to do some work to figure out, unless it's the Wilder rematch, obviously, because that's, you know, that's what people will. Well, they said at the post fight press conference that he's going to have another fight before they yeah. try to make that. They him and Aram said it, so I wouldn't be surprised if you see Jarrell Miller in there. I don't know. No, I wouldn't be either. I mean, like you said. They might. Uh, he, he's shopping again. It's funny to say it, but he he's said shopping. he's interviewed three, and he's got two more promoters yeah. to interview. Can because, you imagine? Because, of, because there's a need for heavyweight opponents. Yeah. I mean, you clearly know, after seeing that Schwartz fight again, I'm sorry to be critical of the guy, but man, he had no business fighting for a title. He was his action said, "I'm scared to death." And the minute he got to him, I, I, the. the, the they said that the corner threw in the towel. I missed that as it was happening. Well, first of all, you would have thought it was against the law to move your head. <laughs> and, and it's not. Somebody should tell him it's, it's allowed. You can't move your head. And he, I mean, you couldn't miss the guy because I had tweeted, because Rob's got me tweeting now, you know. <laughs> and I had tweeted during the, while I was watching it. I said, he's setting the table with the left. He's going to eat pretty soon with the right. Yeah. Which he did in the next round. Yeah. But he turned southpaw and he <laughs> ate from the other side of the table. But same idea. And the reason I said it was you could see all he had to, he's not moving his head. So all he had to do, I want to demonstrate. Uh, so he would, he would just, he would throw the jab and he's not moving his head. So you knew, boom, right down the pipe. Boom, boom. It was just a matter of when he did it, the right timing. I mean, it was it was no mystery. You didn't have to be the Mason Kreskin, you know, or Angelo Dundee, or Gil Clancy, or Eddie Fudge, or Teddy Atlas, or anyone to tell you that. I mean, it was, and you didn't have to be that to tell Fury. Fury saw it right away. You could tell Fury knew as soon as he went down the first time that Fury knew this guy wasn't to use one of the terms that you use frequently is you know it's not a fight until you've overcome or faced some resistance he provided more so than even head movement he provided no resistance as soon as fury started touching him he would became a punching bag and offered nothing he th he landed six total punches in almost two full rounds it was really disappointing i gotta be honest i mean being there i was like dude this is this is what you've this is look at him Zero. Just go ahead. Hit me. Okay, can I get out of here now? And that last punch was a jab, by the way. I know it was a right hand jab with his dominant hand. I get it. But because he turned southpaw. But watch. The last punch. This is where they stop it here. At some point the, the corner is oh, jumping this is after the towel. Right. Yeah, it's not back to the knockdown. There's only three seconds left in the round. Yeah. You can see the corner yeah. behind him throwing in the towel. But, but the ref didn't even see is it. Is this a knockdown here? No, this is the stoppage uh, oh, in the corner. Because if we could go back to the knockdown, you you see it was it was with the jabbing hand because it, again it was his dominant hand because he turned southpaw and he was using the right hand yeah. as as the lead. But you see here, I guess this is it. 
there's a lot, and as to knockdown, it's from the jabbing position, you know. And listen, it was a clean punch. You can knock a guy down with a jab, and again, it was a right hand. Well, jab. especially when he's not uh, fighting right back. on the chin. It was a good place shot. I mean, but again, it was right down the pike. Uh, you blind him with the first punch, and the second punch, you get it in there. He doesn't see it because he's got the earmuffs on, you know, and um, you know, he's in that peekaboo where he's. You know, he's peekaboo. That was just uh, like well, well, the peekaboo without any boo, exactly, uh, or any peek, or any no, definitely no movement. You know, you're supposed to be moving a little bit. It and, was just, uh, it was just massively disappointing, and it's kind of a waste to even talk about Schwartz anymore. But, but I will say, Fury, for to his credit, I thought he looked nice. He was moving yeah. really good. No, I thought I his, think he's the best technical heavyweight. I'm going to give him all the kudos in the world. I think he's probably the best technical heavyweight there is out there right now, and. He's an entertainer, and we That's appreciate all say. that. But I'm also, I'm also going to say what I said earlier with uh, with Triple G. Uh, I'm going to say that he deserves credit for doing what you're supposed to do with that level of opponent. Exactly. Get him out of there. Yeah. Don't let it drag on. That's right. Get him out of there. Yep. Tyson used to say that, and Tyson was right. Mm -hmm. Tyson, you people used to say, "Oh, you're, they're knocking the guy I just fought," which Tyson fought some, you know, some. Uh, you know, some soft ones, yeah. you know, uh, on the way up. And he would say, oh, you knocked the guy I fought, but I did what a good fight is supposed to do with that kind of guy. Yeah. And that he did, Fury did what his level of fighter is supposed to do with that kind of guy. Yeah. And the final thing that I'll finish up for this, for me, with Fury is, and I think that you have to do this because it's part of the equation. It's part of the, it's part of what's there. The story. Yeah. He's got a great story. I, I sent out a tweet. Again, my man Rob got me tweeting like like a madman. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a tweeting madman. I'm, I'm like tweet a bird, uh, <laughs> something like that. Um, so, and I I put it up there that I just felt it. It was uh, I was in my hotel room up in Bristol. Uh, I think it was the day before the fight. And... I root for the guy. And yeah. and I'm not supposed to say that, really, because, you know, but I can say it because I think people trust me enough that if I got to be critical, I'll still be critical. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, I'll do my job like we all want to do. Um, so, but I, I'm, again, I'm supposed to have no bias. And I don't, I don't. I was, you got to be just completely, you're calling a fight for what it is. And I will, and I'll continue doing that. And hopefully the, the people that watch us know that. And that's part of why they watch us. But I, it's nothing wrong with me admitting that I once in a while I root for somebody. I, I root for uh, a good guy. I root for, you know, a guy that's living his life in a decent way, like a Mickey Ward, you know. Or I always rooted for Andre Ward. Not that he needed anyone to root for because he was pretty damn good. Yeah. <laughs> but... But because of the way I thought he lived his life and what he believed in and the, the way he carried himself and, you know, uh, all that that stuff, you know. Same thing with the Tim Bradley. And so I, you know, you can also root somebody for other reasons. You root for them because of what they represent to other people. What George Foreman... When he came back and did what he did, unfortunately against my guy, but when he did what he did at 45 years of age, he gave hope to people that are 45 and over that your dreams should never be over. It's never too late or too old to dream. You're not too old to dream. And sometimes we get screwed up a little bit in this society. We listen to places and things that we shouldn't listen to, and we we get carried by those things. We get coerced by those things. We get moved and influenced by those things. And George represented so many people, you know, uh, that, hey, you can do what you want in life, even if you do it and you're, and you're late at going into it. Look at me. And I think that Fury brings that same thing to people that have been in serious depression. Yeah. It's no secret they didn't show it a lot, but he's very open about it. Three years ago, he went through a bad time in his life where he was in a very dark place, Fury. Uh, he was suicidal. He didn't want to be on the planet anymore. 
They let himself we should go never physically. Get, yeah, everything. And there was abuse of cocaine and alcohol and different things, but uh, which he's very open about. But he, he got to a state of depression where he was thinking something that no human being should ever think. Giving up to the precious gift called life. You got to be in a really dark place to think in those terms. And you know what? The truth is there's people, unfortunately, in our society that get to those dark places. Mm -hmm. And he represents a light. That big, giant, six-foot-nine guy, when he puts those hands above him, you could put a, a light on top of him. And he represents a light to those people that go into those dark places, that have been in those dark places, that you can get out. Mm -hmm. You can get out. Yeah. That... that uh, you can rise up again. I've said this on his end. I'm going to say it again. When when he got dropped by Wilder, that's that's why I got the hundred million dollar fight oh, for yeah. getting up, yep. for getting up. Yep. I'm going to say it again. I believe I saw the replay again. His eyes were open. I believe he was there thinking about whether or not to get up. Yeah. A lot of people would say, "Tell you what, he was thinking." Yeah. Yeah. Even more so now. I I believe it, and that's just my own beliefs. And he was thinking about where he'd been mm -hmm. and he, where he didn't want to go back to. And bang, he got up. And there's always time to get up. And I said it on this air. I'll say it again. For those people out there, it's always time to get up. And he represents, he represents that example to all those people out there that have gotten to a place that they, they don't want to be in, a place that's devoid of hope, a place that's sad, a place that's dark. Uh, he represents to all of them. Just there's a lot of people out there that they need a reason to exist. Yeah, they've lost their reason to exist. He lost it, and he reminds. For me, his story reminds people of what we talk about on this podcast when I started this with you, that we are all in a fight every day. It doesn't have to be a physical fight, but we all fight for something. You know, many different things. Some people fight for approval, success, validation of some kind, or just to know that there's a reason for you to, to be here. And that there's a call for you. And he kind of reminds you that you have to find a reason to answer that call. Each day, the reason could be as simple as seeing it rain again. So you can feel you know, the clear and clean air when it stops. Or it can be to walk out on a stage, any stage. You know, it doesn't have to be a ring any stage, and say, I'm ready. You know, say I bring my heart, my mind, my spirit, my ideas, my beliefs, my cares, my doubts. I want to live. I'm ready to fight. I'm the fury. <laughs> well, he's and, definitely and, living. And, and for me, that's what I see when I see him. And that's bigger than any arena. I don't care. That's bigger than any ring, whether it's an 18-footer or a 24-footer. They get big sometimes. It's, it's bigger than any of those things because it's as big as something called hope. Mm -hmm. And nothing's bigger than hope. And nothing's more important than hope. And nobody should have it taken away from them. Nobody. And he gives it back to them. And for that, I root for him. I appreciate him. And uh, go Fury. Yeah, he's definitely the showman. I mean, he's got probably the biggest personality in the sport right now, and he definitely puts on a show. He, put, he promotes the fight really well, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him do it again with Wilder. I think they'll put on a really entertaining promotion, be a big buildup for the fight, and could be one of the biggest fights we've seen maybe ever. Um, you know, it'll be even bigger. I, I and a lot of people are gonna be surprised to get say, uh, Teddy. There's, and one other thing I want to say: people love redemption, mm -hmm. 
and he brings redemption. It's powerful. It's more powerful than a left hook. Yep. It's more powerful than a straight right hand. And we all want it. And we all hope that it's there for us. And he reminds us, it is. Sometimes you just got to go get it. You got to go there. There. There to make a mistake. There to be wrong. There to flop again. <laughs> but there to live. And, you know, he, a fight that could be even bigger than a rematch with Wilder, even after the terrible performance, is if Joshua beat Ruiz in a rematch. Because that's going to be in London, in an arena that will fill 90,000 seats. And you have redemption on both sides. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That, like, like, like the trainer said, like the trainer said in the first Rocky movie, when they were getting ready for the promotion and all the, the Italian Stein against Apollo Creed. And, and he said, it's like some damn horror movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a movie. Yeah. That's a movie. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's there's some, if people do what they're supposed to do, yeah, the, the, the wilder fight with Fury, it's, it's huge, no doubt about it. But there's a few others. Oh, yeah. Heavyweight division is on fire. And uh, like they say, as goes the um, heavyweight division, so goes the rest of the sport. It appears to be the case. Seems to be a lot of excitement now. And uh, as you know, I'm always excited to go see the fights. <laughs> you, you're the man. You're, you're the, I mean, people, I, I get phone calls. Uh, you know, uh, it's, I don't know if this fight is an official fight yet. I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I didn't see Ken in the arena yet. <laughs> Until Ken gets here, it's not an official. I said, you're right. <laughs> you're right about that. It's not a big fight unless Ken is in that arena. You hear Please that, continue. promoters? And can, that's right. I need and those continue, credentials. And continue giving them love and buying shorts so we can continue to do this. <laughs> I'm the first because, person in because the Because we do have, uh, we have love for you guys, too. Yeah. I was literally the first person in when they opened the door for the undercards, and it was an awesome event. Anyway, we're going to wrap it up here. Thanks for being with us. Again, please support the sponsors, 10,000.cc slash the fight for an exclusive discount code for our fans only. Um, thanks for being with us. Continue to subscribe, share the links, leave comments. Uh, Good ones, nice ones. Today. Preferably. He's sensitive. Preferably. Remember that, please. <laughs> Anyway, thank you for being with us. Thanks for your time, Teddy. Appreciate it as always. Thank you.